She is a diplomate of the Philippine Pediatric Society and a fellow of the Society of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine of the Philippines and also of the Philippine Critical Care Medicine. Currently, she is an active consultant at the Region 1 Medical Center, the Gupan Doctors Villa Flor Memorial Hospital, Nazareth General Hospital, the Medical City Pangasinan, and Blessed Family Doctors Hospital. Our second lecturer is Dr. John R. Fernandez. Dr. Fernandez earned his medical degree at the St. Louis University in Baguio. He had his pediatric residency training at the Region 1 Medical Center and his fellowship training in pediatric critical care at the Philippine Children's Medical Center. He is the training officer of the Region 1 Medical Center Department of Pediatrics and the section head of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit of the same institution. He is an American Heart Association training site coordinator and is a member of the faculty of the Department of Pediatrics of both Lyceum Northwestern University and Virgen Milagrosa University Foundation College of Medicine. He's currently the Vice President of the Philippine Pediatrics Society of Northern Luzon. Our third speaker is Dr. Melinor Aspuria Ang. Dr. Ang earned her medical degree at the University of Santo Tomas, Faculty of Medicine and Surgery. She had her pediatric residency training and fellowship training in pediatric critical care at the Philippine Children's Medical Center. She had her observership training in pediatric intensive care at the John Hopkins University Hospital and post fellowship training in pediatric critical care at the National University Hospital Singapore. Currently, she is the head of the pediatric intensive care unit of the Carina Memorial Medical Center and Far Eastern University Nicanor Reyes Medical Foundation. She is an active consultant at the St. Luke's Medical Center Global City and Philippine Children's Medical Center. She is an assistant professor at the Institute of Medicine, Far Eastern University, Nicanor Reyes Medical Foundation, and a clinical instructor of the Department of Pediatrics and Beda College of Medicine. She's a board of director and head of continuing medical education of the, of the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Our fourth lecturer is Dr. Jerry Acosta. Dr. Acosta earned his medical degree at the University of the East, Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center. He had his pediatric residency training at the Philippine Children's Medical Center and his fellowship training in pediatric cardiology and pediatric echocardiography at the Philippine Heart Center. He is a fellow of the Philippine Pediatric Society, Philippine College of Cardiology, Philippine Society of Echocardiography, and a member of the Philippine Society of Pediatric Cardiology. Currently, he is an active consultant at the Ilocos Training and, Region, and Regional Medical Center and a visiting consultant in various hospitals in Quezon City, Tarlac, and Baguio. He is the immediate past president of our PPS Northern Luzon Society. So... Um, again, let us all welcome our lecturers for this evening. Dr. Binala, you may have the floor. You may have the floor, Dr. Benalay. Ready okay. when you are. Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, tonight, I was tasked to discuss uh, an overview of dengue. So, okay na ba, Jack? Naririnig na? Yes, Doc, loud and clear. Okay. So, this is um, the WHO dengue update, which was released on October 8, 2020. Um, it says here that we have, from January 1st to September 19 of 2020, we have a total of 600, uh, 66,623 dengue cases with 258 deaths reported. Uh, this is actually 80% lower compared to the 335,064 cases reported in the same period of 2019. So dengue is an acute febrile illness caused by an infection with any four serotypes of dengue, the dengue 1, 2, 3, and 4. It is passed from human to human by the bite of a female mosquito. 
Infection um, confers lifelong serotype specific immunity and short term, which is um, two to three months cross immunity. So humans can have four infections in a lifetime. So dengue begins after an incubation period of five to seven days, and the course follows three phases, the febrile, the critical, and the recovery phase. For the febrile phase, it usually lasts uh, two to seven days, characterized by high temperature, uh, associated with a myalgia, headache, retroorbital pain, aches, and rash. It is during this phase wherein a, a clinician can have a difficulty in differentiating dengue from other febrile illnesses. After febrile illnesses, you have, after the febrile phase, you have the critical phase. This usually occurs on day four to day seven of illness. It coincides with defervescence. So most patients clinically improve during this phase, but those with uh, significant plasma leakage, they develop sub severe dengue as a result of an increased vascular permeability. So what happens during the critical phase? During critical phase, there's increased vascular permeability leading to significant plasma leakage and the development of warning signs followed by the clinical deterioration of the patient. This usually um, lasts 24 to 48 hours, and without proper treatment or intervention, death follows. So do all dengue patients enter the critical phase? Not all patients will experience the critical phase. So what happens to patients without significant increase in vascular permeability? The fever subsides, and there is a general uh, improvement in the condition, as well as the appetite though the patient may still have leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. So what is the picture of a patient in recovery phase? During recovery phase, there is a gradual reabsorption of extravascular fluid in the next 48 to 72 hours. You will have the following clues or clinical clues for the improvement of the general well-being with stable hemodynamic status. This is also accompanied by um, diuresis patient's hematocrit stabilizes or may fall due to the dilutional effect of the reabsorbed fluid. WBC starts to rise followed by the recovery of your platelet count. There is also the appearance of your um, Hermann's rash, which is, which is characterized by the, by the Isles of White in the Sea of Red. So this slide shows you the phases of, of dengue illness and the expected laboratory, expected laboratory changes. So during the febrile phase, you will see a downtrend or decreasing level of your WBC and platelet and increasing level of your hematocrit. Patient experience may experience poor oral intake, thus dehydration and inadequate urine output are noted. And during the critical phase, defervescence occur with an increased hematocrit level. It is at this phase where shock occurs because of significant vascular permeability. And during the recovery phase, there is clinical improvement and laboratory value stabilizes. So let's go now to the classification. In November of 2009, WHO proposed dengue classification. It is classified by severity, dengue without and dengue with warning signs and severe dengue. So patient's classification changes as the illness progresses with time. So a patient with probable dengue should be followed up to see whether he or she develops warning signs or severe dengue. It is usually from day, day three to day, day seven. So if the patient's uh, temperature comes down and general condition improves, he or she has dengue without warning signs. And if the patient develops the warning sign during the transition from febrile to afebrile, there is a high risk of developing severe dengue. And all dengue patients with warning signs require close medical attention. So dengue fever is nonspecific and presents like many other diseases. Thus, many conditions and illnesses should be considered in the differential diagnosis. So clinical and laboratory pictures of dengue change as the disease progresses from febrile to critical and evolves into recovery phase. So patient may present to clinicians at any phase of dengue illness. So in early febrile phase, as I have mentioned before, it is not easy to differentiate dengue from other febrile illness as its um, features mimic many other febrile illnesses. 
history taking should focus on whether or not the patient is living in a dengue hotspot. And if the patient is not living in a dengue endemic area, then uh, a history of uh, recent travel to dengue endemic area may raise clinical suspicion of dengue. In early febrile phase, dengue can mimic other flu-like illnesses. And these are the conditions that mimic the febrile phase of dengue. However, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, healthcare providers need to consider dengue and COVID-19 in the differential diagnosis of an acute febrile illness. Um, as, dengue progress, as dengue disease progresses into critical phase, it becomes easier and clearer to recognize. Attention should be paid on the development of warning signs and the typical laboratory changes that may occur. In dengue, typically, there would be progressive leukopenia accompanied by progressive thrombocytopenia and rising hematocrit. And liver transaminases would, transaminases would also be elevated. There are, some, there are some surgical as well as medical conditions that could mimic dengue during the critical phase. So for the surgical cases, we have an acute abdomen, such as acute appendicitis, acute cholecystitis, and perforated viscous, and the rest are the medical conditions. So for the clinical examination, um, this, shows, this show the quick guide in doing your um, examination on dengue patient. This is the five-in-one maneuver or your CCTVR. So how is it done? Um, you have to hold the hand of the patient to evaluate the peripheral perfusion. You check for the color, which should be pink. Check for the CRT, which should be two seconds or less. Check for the temperature, which should be warm. Pulse volume should be full and pulse rate should be within the acceptable value for age. So holding the patient's hand to evaluate the peripheral perfusion in less than 30 seconds, it can help you to assess the peripheral perfusion. You can know immediately if it is normal or reduced. So we actually have nine parameters in the, in the hemodynamic assessment of patients. And doing your CCTVR already helps you assess five of the nine parameters. So to assess peri peripheral perfusion, you have your CRT, color, temperature, and peripheral pulse volume. And to check for the cardiac output, you have your heart rate, the pulse pressure, and your blood pressure. And to check for the organ uh, perfusion, you have your level of consciousness and the uh, urine output. And to check for um, your uh, respiratory compensation, you have your respiratory rate. So this slide shows you the uh, result or the um, of uh, or the result of patients with stable circulation. And this slide shows you uh, the patient in compensated shock. There is reduced peripheral perfusion, which is seen as prolonged CRT, cold extremities with uh, 30 pulse, reduced cardiac output, seen as, seen as tachycardia, rising diastolic pressure, and narrow pulse pressure, and reduced reduced renal perfusion, seen as um, reduced urine output. But you have to note that in compensated shock, changes are seen in all except for the uh, level of consciousness and the systolic pressure. This slide shows you the result of patient in hypotensive, hypotensive shock. There is reduced brain perfusion, reduced peripheral perfusion, reduced cardiac output, and severe tissue acidosis. In short, the patient is in the, in the compensated shock. And if this goes further and or continues further without any intervention, death eventually follows. So for the management, group A, are pa are, group a patients are those without warning signs and can be managed as outpatient. These are patients who are able to drink and urinate adequately with and they don't have any warning signs. They have stable hematocrit and hemodynamic status. So what uh, are you going to do? You have to advise them for daily follow-up and do serial CBC and give them anticipatory guidance. You also have to mention the what to watch out for, especially the warning signs. Group B patients are those with warning signs and coexisting medical conditions. And also they have social circumstances like living alone or living far away without a reliable means of transport. 
So what should be done? You have to admit pay, uh, you have to admit them, monitor their hemodynamic status, and correct metabolic acidosis or electrolytes as needed. So group C patients are those with severe dengue in need of emergency treatment and urgent referral. So these uh, group C patients are those with severe plasma leakage, severe bleeding, and severe organ impairment. So as I've said earlier, there is a need for the, they require emergency treatment and urgent referral. So what are your discharge criteria? The patient should be a febrile for 24 to 48 hours. There is improvement in clinical status. There is increasing trend of your platelet count. So there, there's no need for you to wait for the platelet count to be normal. As long as you see a decreasing trend, I think you should, uh, this uh, criteria should be considered. Stable hematocrit with oral intake and off IV fluids and the presence of the rash. You can see the, the characteristic of the rash, which is, which is um, Isles of White in a Sea of Red. So what are the do's and don'ts in dengue management? So for the don'ts of uh, dengue management, don't use corticosteroids. Don't give uh, platelet transfusion for a low platelet count. Okay. Um, don't give half normal saline. And for the do's, of course, you have two there. You... Sorry, you have to uh, tell out patients when to return and recognize the critical period, closely monitor your fluid intake, recognize and treat early shock and administer colloids and give PAC RBCs as our blood transfusion as needed. Sorry. Okay, I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Jackie. Thank you, Dr. Benalay, for a thorough review of dengue. I highly appreciate the do's and don'ts in dengue management. So for our next lecture, may I call on Dr. John Fernandez to discuss on COVID, how COVID-19 changed dengue diagnosis. Dr. John? Can you see the slide? No. Wait lang. Here is my PowerPoint. Jackie. There. Can you see the slide, Jackie? Yes, no. Okay. Okay. So good evening, everyone. So I was tasked to discuss how COVID-19 changed dengue diagnosis. Does it really change? So early signs and symptoms of dengue and COVID-19 could be similar. So making it a risk that patients may be wrongly diagnosed early in the course of disease. There's a risk that dengue and COVID-19 could overwhelm healthcare systems, not just in our country, but across the uh, multiple countries. So we were taught that arriving at a certain diagnosis of open, is often complex involving multiple steps, taking an appropriate history of symptoms and collecting relevant data. We have to perform a complete physical examination before generating a provisional and differential diagnosis and before ordering laboratory testing or diagnostic tests. At the beginning of 2020, we are faced with unprecedented public health challenges. A noble strain of coronavirus, later identified as severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2, has spread globally, marking another pandemic of coronaviruses. 
The viral disease is responsible for devastating pneumonia, named coronavirus disease of 2019 or your COVID-19, and projected to persist until the end of the year. In tropical countries like Philippines, however, concern arise regarding the similarities of COVID-19 with other infectious diseases due to same chief complaint, which is fever. One of the infectious diseases of primary concern is dengue infection, which is now on its peak season. So the, the, the objective of my talk is to know the importance of knowing similar clinical presentations and pathophysiology of COVID-19 and dengue fever, to know the diagnostic tests for COVID-19 and dengue fever, to emphasize why excluding dengue or COVID-19 in the differentials in the setting of a pandemic is imprudent. So let's review first the differences between the two as to the structure, okay? So your SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope positive sense RNA virus that belongs to the beta coronavirus genus. Its diameter is 65 to 125 nanometers, contain a single strand of RNA, and it's coated by a crown-like spikes on its outer surface. That, that's why it's called or it's termed corona. While your dengue virus is one of the viral hemorrhagic fever that belongs to Flaviberi Day family, and its structure is smaller than SARS-CoV-2. Its diameter is 15 nanometers, and it contains a single stranded RNA2. So SARS-CoV-2 has four main structural proteins, including spike glycoprotein, nucocapsid protein, uh, envelope glycoprotein, a membrane glycoprotein and your nucleocapsid protein. So this nucleocapsid protein is responsible for the viral genome and viral replication cycle. The dengue virus does not have spike protein, but has three main structural proteins, I, protein genes, including your nucleocapsid or core protein, your membrane glycoprotein and envelope protein. So dengue virus has seven non-structural protein genes in which is your NS1 diagnostic and pathologic importance in the confirmation of dengue infection. So as to transmission, COVID, we all know that COVID is transmitted by a person to person through respiratory droplets that are spread when an infected person coughs, sneezes or talks. While in dengue, you no, know, it's a vector borne disease, mainly transmitted to people through the bites of infected Aedes species mosquitoes, like your Aedes aegypti and your Aedes albopticus. As to prevention, uh, these are infographics by the Department of Health on how to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 and dengue. And we have seen other ways earlier this year, aside from those ways, mentioned by the DOH, we have your disinfecting sprays that are not actually are not acceptable and indiscriminate fogging when it's not endemic. But we can use mosquito nets as self-protection measures for dengue, but unfortunately, it will not protect us from COVID-19. So COVID and dengue infection are hard to distinguish because they, are, they have similar clinical features. For the incubation period, COVID-19 is thought to extend to 14 days with a median of four to five days from exposure to symptom onset. While the incubation period for dengue ranges from three to 10 days, typically five to seven days. So the clinical course or the clinical manifestation of both dengue and COVID-19 can range from mild to critical. So as Dr. Binalai discussed, I am showing you the clinical course of dengue where common symptoms like fever and, other, and others usually last two to seven days during febrile phase, where we usually catch our dengue patients and may be similar to COVID-19. Moreover, there are some misdiagnosed cases of dengue suspected patients that later confirm to be SARS-CoV-2 infection. Here, we present a number of COVID-19 symptoms and their similarities with dengue. So most patients with confirmed COVID-19 have fever or acute respiratory illness, 
However, various um, other symptoms have been associated with COVID-19. The list is not conclusive of all reported symptoms. These symptoms are also not specific for COVID-19 and the predictive value of a single symptom in the diagnosis of COVID-19 is uncertain. A study done by Henrina and company that uh, regarding the proportion of clinical manifestation differences between COVID-19 and dengue patient, fever is the most common chief complaint in both dengue fever and COVID-19 patients. In COVID-19, headache is an uncommon clinical presentation. Musculoskeletal symptoms present variably in COVID-19 patients and cough is the most common respiratory symptom in addition to fever and usually presents in the first two until the fourth day of illness. It is noteworthy that patients with COVID-19 can present with gastrointestinal symptoms such as your diarrhea, abdominal pain, vomiting, and nausea. Cutaneous involvement in viral diseases in, in, uh, is a common phenomenon, including COVID-19. One patient was initially mistaken with um, dengue infection due to skin rash presenting as PTK and laboratory findings of thrombocytopenia. So I'm now showing you the pathophysiological similarities between uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever and COVID-19. Plasma leakage, thrombocytopenia, and coagulopathy are the hematological hallmarks of dengue hemorrhagic fever and COVID-19. Both dengue virus and SARS-CoV-2 induce the activation of your immune cells leading to the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as your tumor nucleosis factor and your interleukin-6. So this event promotes increased vascular permeability that leads to plasma leakage. In dengue hemorrhagic fever cases, the destruction of platelets in the peripheral region by dengue virus has been suggested as the cause of thrombocytopenia, which in the end culminates as coagulopathy, DIC, and in some cases results in the death. So what thrombocytopenia was also evident in COVID-19 patients, pathophysiological mechanism on how such event has occurred remain to be elucidated. Current data indicating that endothelial damage coupled with platelet apoptosis and impaired bone marrow growth might be the drivers of thrombocytopenia and coagulopathy in SARS-CoV-2 infected patients. The sequential pathophysiological process leads to the occurrence of DIC and the death of COVID-19 patients remains to be demonstrated. Still from the study of Henrina and company, the proportion of laboratory findings differences between COVID-19 and dengue patients, thrombocytopenia is more prevalent in COVID-19 patients compared to thrombocytosis. It is possible that SARS-CoV-2 causes leukopenia through the same pathomechanism of thrombocytopenia, which is bone marrow suppression. Leukopenia in dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue fever is attributed to the fact that dengue virus causes myeloid progenitor cell destruction and inhibition. So in COVID-19, the pathomechanism of lymphopenia is still unknown, whereas in pathomechanism of lymphopenia in dengue infection have three pathways. We have a direct infection of dengue virus to the hematopoietic progenitor cells activated dengue specific T cells and marrow stromal cells infection by dengue virus that result to marrow suppression of cytokines. In addition, dengue virus can cause generalized bone marrow suppression leading to lymphopenia. COVID-19 patients showed increased levels of D-dimer. D-dimer levels were elevated in dengue patients as well. So the D-dimer is used for prognostic study for predictive of severe dengue or dengue hemorrhagic fever. So uh, comparing dengue virus or dengue, dengue fever from coronavirus with regards to the severity, 
in COVID-19, among patients who develop severe disease, the medium time to dyspnea range from five to eight days. The median time to acute respiratory distress or ARDS range from eight to 12 days. And the median time to ICU admission range from 10 to 12 days. So these are the signs and symptoms for severe illness, includes your dyspnea, hypoxia, leading to respiratory failure. Then the patient will be placed in advanced airway, then shock, then followed by multiple or multi-organ system dysfunction. So the, uh, the clinicians should be aware of the potential for some patients for to rapidly deteriorate one week after illness onset. So what makes it severe dengue? So Dr. Binale discussed the three reasons due to severe plasma leakage, due to severe bleeding and severe organ impairment. So this is my problem as a critical care specialist during these COVID times. One, waiting and outpatient, waiting time at outpatient and emergency department. So we were thought of how to perform your five-in-one magic touch, your CCTDR, but what if you are, you are in your complete or level four PPE? And remember, a febrile patients get the lowest triage in the emergency department. So patient can develop shock, prolonged shock while waiting to be seen and or waiting for a CBC or rapid test or classic or tagging as a COVID-19 suspect to be admitted, okay? So the dengue disease becomes more severe during the waiting period with longer duration of shock. And remember, shock is difficult to be detected without touching the patient because of the patient's good conscious level. So the risk factors for severe illness for both COVID-19 and dengue, so, we all know that at more than age 65 and there are underlying conditions are risk factor to become a severe COVID-19. While in infants, risk factors for severe dengue include, uh, for dengue is less than one year older infant, second, second dengue infection or repeated dengue infection, patients with chronic medical conditions. Now, is it really dengue or is it COVID-19 if you are faced with patient with acute febrile illness? Although similarities between COVID-19 and dengue fever are remarkable in clinical presentations, we thought maybe we would circumvent these problems with a serologic testing. Unfortunately, it is not the case in COVID-19. There have been cases reporting serologic or serological cross-reaction of patients who were thought initially to be infected with dengue virus only to test positive of SARS-CoV-2 infection by your RT-PCR or your swab test. There was a case report um, done by Enrina for, uh, as coronavirus disease of 2019, a mimicker of dengue infection. A nurse contracted COVID-19 infection during performing a blood draw from a patient that was provisionally diagnosed with dengue infection. So due to this diagnosis, the nurse does not wear appropriate PPE for COVID-19. So what does this mean? Therefore, when a diagnosis of an infectious disease is not yet firmly established, we believe it is judicious to take additional safety measures by using the appropriate PPE. Especially in the setting of a pandemic in tropical countries, which other diseases might obscure COVID-19 diagnosis. Another study from, by Sadike, where there's an emergence of co-infection of COVID-19 and dengue, which is a serious public health threat, Co-infection of COVID-19 and dengue has already been reported from Asian countries such as Singapore, Thailand, India, and Bangladesh. And the emergence of COVID-19 and dengue co-infection warrants further investigation at country level to understand potential of COVID-19 and dengue outbreaks, outbreaks in upcoming post-monsoon months with elevated dengue infections. Another um, uh, study 
by Sri Mangini, they conclude that the study provided the evidence of cross-reactivity uh, cross between dengue virus and SARS-CoV-2, which led to false positive COVID-19 serology and um, among dengue patients. This underscores the importance of a simple and affordable rapid test that is capable of differentiating dengue virus and SARS-CoV-2 with high sensitivity at the early phase of infection, as well as enhancing the laboratory network capacities in the region. So this figure shows how laboratory diagnosis of dengue virus infection established directly by detection of your viral components in the serum or indirectly by serology. The sensitivity of each approach depends on the duration of the patient's illness, as well as when the course of illness the patient presents for evaluation. And the detection of nucleic acid or your viral antigen has high specificity, but is more labor intensive and costly. Serology has lower specificity, but it is more accessible and loss or uh, less costly. Okay, during the first week of illness, detection of viral antigen or your NS1 is typically positive. So, so if prime, in primary infection, the sensitivity of NS1 detection can exceed 90%. So if you have NS1 positive, that's dengue. And antigenemia may persist for several days after resolution of fever. In secondary infection, the sensitivity of NS1 detection is lower, which is 60 to 80%. So in this diagram, your IgM can be detected as early as four days after the onset of illness. The likelihood of IgG detection depends on whether the infection is primary or secondary. So primary dengue infection is characterized by a slow and low titer antibody response. So your IgG is detectable at lower titer beginning seven days after onset of illness and increases slowly. During secondary inf dengue infection, it's, it is characterized by a rapid rise in antibody titer beginning four days after onset of illness with broad cross reactivity. So there's a um, study entitled Low Risk of Serological Cross-Reactivity Between Dengue and COVID-19. And their conclusion was among the 32 COVID-19 positive sera, meaning the patients are COVID positive. They test for dengue, dengue uh, serol serological test for dengue and no positive dengue virus results were observed. On the other hand, one false positive result was observed among 44 dengue patients and for COVID-19 antibodies, which of the two rapid tests used. So further data and accuracy of COVID-19 diagnostic tests are urgently warranted. So your, your nucleic acid amplification testing is the most commonly, uh, uh, your RT-PCR, reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction assay, to detect SARS-CoV RNA from the upper respiratory tract is the preferred initial diagnostic test for COVID-19. For many symptomatic individuals, a single negative RT-PCR test is sufficient to exclude the diagnosis of COVID-19. However, if the initial Testing is negative, but the suspicion of COVID-19 remains high and confirming the presence of infection is important for management or infection control, we suggest repeating the test. So just like in this picture, so Sally was exposed to a COVID-19 patient. So, so day zero. On day five, she, she got tested and the result came back and it turned out to be negative. So thinking that Sally was negative for COVID-19, she attended school and family cookout and she was contagious days eight and nine. So 48 hours before the symptoms and now exposed to 17 people. So on day 10, day 10 Sally became symptomatic and 
tested positive. So see the importance of repeating if you have high index of suspicion that this patient may have COVID-19. So this table shows the diagnostic test for COVID-19. So these are the test category and the specimen type that you will use and the performance characteristics of each test, including the time to, to perform the test and its turnaround time. And this table shows the suggested priorities to COVID-19 testing. So whether it's high or first priority, second, third, and look at your high priority are those patients that are critically ill or any individual with fever or may, meaning they're symptomatic with close contact with patients laboratory confirmed with COVID-19. So given limited testing resources, some institutions perform targeted testing in the outpatient setting. So for children who are evaluated for symptoms consistent with COVID-19 in the emergency department or urgent care setting, we should perform testing for SARS-CoV-2 if the child has underlying condition that may increase the risk of severe disease, if the patient's known in person exposure to a laboratory confirmed case of COVID-19 within the previous 14 days, and the presentation is severe. So indications for testing asymptomatic individuals include close contact with an individual with COVID-19, but take note of the timing of the testing and post-exposure testing should be done five to seven days after exposure, although the optimal timing is uncertain. So I will not further discuss MISC, but this table outlines the CDC's and WHO's case definition of MISC. So patients who meet this criteria and who also fulfill full or partial criteria for Kawasaki disease should be considered to have MISC and should be reported. In addition, MISC should be considered in any pediatric death with evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And the clinical spectrum of COVID-19 and COVID-19 associated MISC in children or MISC, it is apparent that the spectrum of disease ranges from mild to severe. So the, the understanding of the full spectrum includes subphenotypes is evolving. Uh, there, may be some uh, there may be some between these categories. It remains unclear how common each presentation is, how frequently children progress from mild to more severe in manifestations, and what the risk factors for such progressions. So in summary, what you need to know during the COVID-19 pandemic, healthcare providers in areas where dengue is endemic or who are treating patients with recent trouble history to these areas need to consider dengue and COVID-19 in the differential diagnosis of acute febrile illnesses. Most people with dengue and COVID-19 have mild illness and can recover at home. It depends on, uh, on the set setting and symptoms usually last a few days and people tend to feel better after a week. However, both dengue and COVID-19 can cause severe illness that can result in death. And the clinical management for people who develop severe illness with either of these two diseases is quite different, often requiring hospital-based care. So any, anyone of any age can develop severe illness with dengue or COVID-19. Healthcare providers should perform appropriate tests for dengue fever and COVID-19 and follow the patient closely for warning signs. Complications for both dengue and COVID-19 can develop before test results come back and clinical management should be guided by clinical presentation. Co-infection poses a challenge for accurate diagnosis and treatment, particularly when symptoms such as fever and aches are similar, similar for several viral diseases like your COVID-19 and dengue. So 
these are the objectives. So I have discussed the importance of knowing similar clinical presentations and pathophysiology of COVID-19 and dengue fever. We know now, we now know the diagnostic test for COVID-19 and dengue fever, and we should not I already convince you that we should not exclude COVID-19 in the differentials in the setting of a pandemic. Thank you. Back to you, Jackie. Thank you, Dr. John Fernandez, for shedding light on how COVID-19 has changed dengue diagnosis and more. So again, as a reminder, questions will be entertained at the end of the session. Please type in your questions at the Q&A tab. And if you see questions that you want to prioritize, kindly upvote them by clicking like. So for our third speaker, may I call on Dr. Melanor Ang to discuss how COVID-19 changed dengue management. Good evening, Dr. Ang. This cartoon image depicts what is dengue to us. Our hands are full with the COVID-19, and now with rainy season, it is here to haunt us. We have these concerns about the impact that significant co-circulation of the dengue viruses and COVID-19 could have in our healthcare system. I do lecture for pharmaceutical companies, but this talk is not in any way connected with them. I'm pretty sure that these are the questions lingering in your mind as of the moment. So aside from the differential diagnosis, there is always a possibility of co-infections and it is still not yet known whether these co-infections will lead to a greater severity or can result to complex and unpredictable consequences. With these joint epidemics, it can lead to several collateral damage. So this should be a point of vigilance among us doctors. It is somewhat comforting that data from the CDC showed that cases of dengue and COVID-19 for children are for most part mild cases. So it lessens the burden in our part. This would be the outline of my talk. We'll be discussing outpatient management, inpatient management, and then um, dengue cases that we had with co-infection. So as we go along, let us see if dengue management changed in times of COVID. The outpatient management for both is almost the same. Those patients who deem to be stable and follow-ups are assured, either by telemedicine or face-to-face -face checkup, can be taken care of at home. However, it will differ in the isolation protocol. We all know that for dengue, we don't need isolation precaution, but for COVID-19, this is a must. On times that they are still on very meek or symptomatic phase, and that would be the first 10 days. So do we do isolation protocol in dengue? This actually depends if RT-PCR was done, awaiting results, or highly suspicious of COVID co-infection as well. But if we follow the interim COVID pathway from the WHO of May 2020, those whom, if suspicious of co-infection, they have to be isolated. For both of them, symptomatic treatments such as antipyretics for fever and pain and then appropriate rehydration is actually advised. I think um, some of the LGU house this asymptomatic COVID-19 patients, but that would be according to the LGU protocol. Regarding multivitamins and minerals, this was lifted from the PITSP guidelines, but I guess if these kids are given balanced, healthy diet, supplements are not warranted. As a review as well, the course which we are after are the warning signs for dengue, which occur after defervescence. 
And for COVID-19, the median time for dyspnea would be 5 to 8 days and 8 to 12 days for ARDS and IC admission of 10 to 12 days. These are the warning signs and symptoms in dengue that we should be wary of. For the inpatient management, we admit those patients on dengue with or without warning signs and those in group C who presented with shock. On COVID-19, we also admit patients under moderate, severe, and critical. From the WHO, dengue initial screening labs are the following. Results will depend on the day of illness and also if it's a primary or a secondary infection. In secondary infection, usually IgG is already high from the start as opposed to primary infection where it will start to rise at a later date. For suspected cases of COVID-19, according to the WHO protocol collection, of upper respiratory tract specimens, nasopharyngeal and the oropharyngeal for testing for reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction or the RT-PCR. When we say virus testing, usually it tells you who is infected at this moment in time and can give you an opportunity, of course, to act and then respond appropriately. SARS-CoV-2 antibody tests are not recommended for diagnosis of a current infection with COVID-19. I'm sure you've heard of rapid antigen tests or rather the rapid lateral flow antigen test. This test is sensitive to detect infectious people who have the disease so they have um, low analytic sensitivity, but with high frequency testing. It's low cost, but with rapid results. As per DOH memorandum, rapid antigen tests shall be allowed for diagnostic testing of suspects. So mainly, it can be used in the hospital setting when RT-PCR capacity is insufficient where the turnaround time is also critical to guide patient cohort management. Um, I saw this um, article in the DOH website that Bagby City is chosen for a pilot use of antigen test. So we wait for this paper to come out as well. As no new guidelines, still standard precaution is adapted for dengue and isolation precaution is in instituted for COVID-19. Airborne precaution for those um, aerosol generating procedures like your intubation and your suctioning and whether dengue will be isolated as well with a possible COVID-19 that is likely to coexist, this would be according to the hospital policy so it's um, institutionalized. In dengue, we already have the guidelines from the WHO and the PPS guidelines. So it's judicious because we use this guidance to a good judgment on the IV fluid titration. However, for COVID-19, according to WHO, use cautious fluid management in patients without tissue hyperperfusion and fluid responsiveness. So just enough fluids is needed. We are careful or we exercise caution in COVID-19 because aggressive fluid resuscitation may worsen the oxygenation, especially in the settings when there is um, limited availability of mechanical ventilation. Both crisis entity entails the use of isotonic solutions. So for group B patients with coexisting condition or comorbidities, you may or may not start your IV fluids. 
Um, it will depend on the patient's hydration status and then, of course, the circumstances. I am sure you're all familiar with these algorithms we use for dengue with warning signs. Starter IV fluids, then you titrate down the accordingly through, of course, with your clinical assessment improvement. Also, these algorithms are used for compensated and hypertensive shock. Again, to reiterate, compensated shock, we give the 10 mils per kilo to run for an hour, then you reassess for improvement. But for hypertensive shock, we give um, 20 mils per kilo over 15 to 30 minutes, then again, reassess if it improved or not, then they treat it accordingly. For DECI patients, we do request for electrolytes, um, blood gases, and um, organ laboratories like your liver function and the renal panel, depending, of course, with the severity of dengue. We also do to the echoes, um, we do procalcitonine or blood culture if warranted or thinking of a concomitant bacterial infection. However, for COVID-19 presenting moderate, severe, or critical, so aside from these laboratories, we also add um, inflammatory markers. In shock patients, we always employ O2 at 10 to 15 liters per minute via your non-rebreathing mask. For COVID, oxygenation is given for SATs less than 94% and then weaned accordingly. No treatment for dengue or rather only supportive treatment, but in COVID-19, there are experimental drugs that are used. This is from the PPS and the PSP guidelines, antiviral treatment, which includes um, remdesivir. And these are the adjunct treatment options. So what happens if they coexist? What is worrisome for us clinicians is the lack of experience of their combined effects. So there are international reports that are, we are already seeing the coexistence of both diseases, but I will present to you clinical profiles of patients that we had in our institution. This is a case series of dengue patients admitted at our institution, also confirmed COVID-19 by RT-PCR. We've seen a decline of our dengue admission since the pandemic and um, to calculate, it's approximately 4% of our total dengue admissions and 6 to 7% from the total COVID positive admissions. The COVID response team, along with the ICC of our institution, mandates that patients with the CCFD symptoms are triaged to be admitted at the COVID ward if admission is warranted. CCFD stands for cough, colds, fever, and diarrhea. Clinical profiles of these patients, mostly male, aged ranging from 4 to 17 years old, and they are admitted on the day 5 of illness, and they present with shock. Those in shock have hemoconcentration and um, thrombocytopenia. Some have chest x-ray findings of pneumonia and there were no adjunct treatment given for COVID. Our institution is not a COVID referral center that's from Desivir or Tocilizumab is not available. However, most of them were given antibiotics since um, they also presented with shock with the organ laboratories as well as inflammatory markers for COVID-19, but most of these labs were non-contributory. And five out of the six were discharged. They are discharged, of course, according to the WHO and then the PPS guidelines. However, we had one mortality 
um, he is severely malnourished with cerebral palsy and then of course um, the patient is bedridden for most parts. This patient um, presents with a GA bleed on admission with a BP of zero. Uh, it also presents with severe acidosis and then refractory shock, fluid resistant as well as catecholamine resistant. Patient was given hydrocortisone. Um, vasopressors were instituted as well as the antibiotics. Eventually intubated and then we contemplated giving of IVIG, however, the patient succumbed to death within the 48 hours of hospital admission. So did we change our dengue management? No, but we are more cautious of co-infection. With more exposure to this probable than them, we might have better chance of treating them accordingly so let us all be vigilant and let us be optimistic, of course, with good outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Ang, for your lecture on how COVID-19 changed dengue management or how it did not change dengue management and presenting a case series of your patients. So saving the best lecture for last, we have Dr. Jerry Acosta to discuss the management of cardiac patients with dengue in COVID times. Good evening, Dr. Acosta. Me? Evening, sir. Hello. Uh, naririnig ba ako? Yes, Doc. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, PPS Norlu for inviting me to be a lecturer. And actually, this is really an unthinkable uh, combination because I was, I am in the company of very esteemed pediatric intensivist, cardiac uh, critical care. So my topic is that uh, to discuss the management of cardiac patients with dengue in COVID times. Okay. Next uh, disclosure, I have nothing to disclose. My objective is to discuss myocarditis, to discuss dengue myocarditis, and probably to compare dengue and COVID cardiac manifestations. So why myocarditis? Because we know that myocarditis is the most common complications, cardiac complications in dengue. So just a review, myocarditis is the acute inflammation of the myocardium diagnosed by a combination of histologic, immunologic, and immunohistochemical criteria. Myocarditis, the epidemiology is that can occur one to two cases per 100,000. And it is also a cause of sudden cardiac death and even sudden infant death. Causes of myocarditis, as you can see in this table, we have the infectious causes, which are the viral, and we have the dengue. But in this, in this uh, table, COVID-19 COVID is not yet placed as the cause of myocarditis. Maybe the subsequent information will be, uh, we can already include COVID-19 as one of the cause. These are the usual manifestation of myocarditis as they present with chest pain, palpitations, arrhythmias, hypotension, pulmonary edema, and features of shock, especially in patients with severe heart failure. Diagnosis of myocarditis is usually the gold standard is endomyocardial biopsy by using the Dallas criteria. And it is also used to detect cardiotropic virus. However, this has a low sensitivity due to something error. And another, um, another diagnostic criteria or diagnose, diagnostic modality is your cardiac MRI, which can up, up, 
which can use to avail, uh, has the ability to evaluate for edema, hyperemia, fibrosis, and scarring of the myocardium. So this is your Dallas criteria. However, this is not only this is not used as solely criteria because you have to go to clinical. So they say that if you don't have in settings where biopsy and CMR are unavailable, the diagnosis of myocarditis can be made based on the combination of clinical findings that is affected patients may have all of these patients, like your signs and symptoms of cardiac dysfunction, like your chest pain, easy fatigability or topnia, and elevated troponin and echocardiographic evidence of ventricular dysfunction without an underlying structural cardiac defect. Also, it can have a present in most patients variable decrease, uh, but not all patients should have your prodromal illness, history of prodromal illness like your respiratory or gastrointestinal, and even electrocardiographic changes suggestive of acute myocardial injury or arrhythmia. So let's go now to dengue myocarditis. As was, as was uh, stated before our previous lectures, this is one of the most important mosquito-borne illness worldwide, and it was by four stereotypes, the one, two, three, and four. Okay, viral infection is the most common cause of acute myocarditis, and myocarditis is the most common cardiac manifestation in dengue fever. However, the main mechanism of dengue myocarditis is still unknown. It has a low incidence because they are mostly asymptomatic and have vague symptoms and diagnosis easily missed. One of the worst outbreak during the worst outbreak in China in August to October 2014, 201 out of 1,702 patients diagnosed with myocarditis were found to have myocarditis, and the prevalence rate at that time was 11.2%. This is the pathophysiology, as was, state, as was discussed. There is plasma leakage in dengue, which occurs around the time, uh, approximately 48 to 72 hours, and this plasma leakage can lead to shock, and then the principal mechanism, principal mechanism of shock is due to the decreased intravascular volume, abnormal cardiac function, which can contribute to cardiovascular compromise. And cardiac performance and hemodynamic status are affected by intravascular volume, the cardiac function, and the autonomic response. Pathophysiology of dengue is that the dengue virus is taken up into macrophage with resulting of your T-cells activation and release of your vasoactive and pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is implicated in the capillary leak and possibly also in the myocardial impairment. The interaction between your NS1 and the glycocalyx layer of the vascular endothelium, endothelium is thought to increase the capillary permeability. The resulting capillary permeability will lead to reduced preload and it causes also altered coronary my, my, microcirculation and myocardial, myocardial interstitial edema. Also, the altered intracellular calcium hemostasis has also been demonstrated in dengue infected myotubes. All of this can cause now your myocardial impairment. Pathology-wise, they some one of the study detects um, it directly in, detects the DNA virus in immunofluorescent study in one of the study done in Colombia and South Amer America, which alters the calcium storage of skeletal muscle. And these observations, they said that they noticed that there is the direct the virus directly infects and alters the calcium storage of skeletal muscles, causing dysfunction in the myocytes and skeletal muscle fibers. As to the type that causes myocarditis, 
D and V3 is associated with unusual manifestation of dengue and asymptomatic myocarditis. And also, a report in the Sri Lanka, in a Sri Lanka study or case report described three cases of myocarditis associated with dengue virus T. However, no reports associated with D and V4. How about the manifestations? Myocardial dysfunction in acute dengue has been documented in several studies using a variety of techniques. However, this dysfunction is transient except in minority of patients who develop fulminant or fatal myocarditis. As you can see in this study, you have the age, you have the, and then they have, they notice, uh, they examine the methods of cardiac assessment. It is from echocardiography, where in the main, uh, the main findings, they have systolic impairment. And also, they also use the radionuclide ventriculography and also your uh, echocardiography. Also, one of the study also use the parameters of biomarkers, your cardiac biomarkers, and also your electrocardiographic finding, your ECG or biomarkers. So as you can see, the manifestations are, are, the, uh, are the manifestations could be an ECG alteration, it could be an echocardiographic alterations, and even a laboratory alterations. Electrocardiographic alterations is reported in dengue often transient and non-specific. It occurs primarily in the recovery phase. However, some of this is being also noticed in the other phases of dengue. It occurs around 30 to 44 percent of patients hospitalized with dengue, and these arrhythmias tend to be self-limiting and benign. And the ECG changes might be only sign of cardiac involvement with normal biomarkers. The underlying mechanisms is that there, there could be altered autonomic tone, electrolyte and calcium imbalances, and subclinical myocarditis. It could, be, it could present as relative bradycardia, which we usually see or referred to us, especially if we were thinking of dengue myocarditis, but it can also occur, it can also present as disorders of atrioventricular conduction from complete heart block to PVCs, flutters, atrial fibrillations, and even tachybrady arrhythmia. But as I have said, these are transient and non-specific. How about echocardiographic findings? Echocardiography is being done, especially if you want, if you want to check the contractility or the function of your LV function or the right ventricular, uh, right ventricular function, because especially in your resuscitation, in your fluid resuscitation, you want to check the contractility it's for us to limit or for us for the, the judicious use of your fluid resuscitation. Some studies said that functional cardiac abnormalities in both systolic and diastolic functions are correlated with the severity of plasma leakage. Cardiac dysfunction again was transient and did not require specific treatment. The decreased LV while diastolic movement may be contributed to abnormal LV feeling and the predisposition for pulmonary edema in dengue, in dengue hemorrhagic fever. Another study Another study showed that out of the 60 patients the cardiac manifestations in dengue, sinus bradycardia was seen to be simply uh, the, 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 dominant, the dominant findings of 15%. Sinus tachycardia is also noted. Echocardiography was normal in 54, and systolic dysfunction was found in 6.6, and even pericardial effusion was found in 3.3% of patients. So how, how, we, how do we evaluate? The usual evaluation still, you have to do your electrocardiography, you have to do your chest radiogram, and if, if needed, you have to do your echocardiogram, and even the cardiac biomarkers are, are being ordered, like your troponin, and your BNP and uh, natriotic peptides. Cardiac troponin or troponin 1 will ref reflect myocardial injury. 
But take note that elevated troponin is seen in most but not all patients with myocarditis. However, so this is a non-specific finding and should be interpreted in conjunction with other clinical and echocardiographic findings. How about, uh, and although elevated levels of troponin are seen in the majority of patients with myocarditis, but it does not mean that you, if you have a higher level, it does not necessarily co correlate with the severity of your illnesses. How about your BNP? BNP is being, is being ordered, especially if you want to rule out, like if you have failure or heart failure, could this be secondary to your cardiac or respiratory, respiratory problem? How about your chest radiograph? You want to order for the chest, reg, chest radiograph to check for the size of your heart. Echocardiogram, as I had said, is being ordered, is being ordered if, if for evaluation of your cardiac function. ESR and CRP are also ordered as an inflammatory markers, but these are not specific. So this was taken in a journal where the evaluation is that if you have patients with dengue and you have inappropriate bradycardia or tachycardia for clinical setting or age, or if you have cardiac specific symptoms or high, high risk groups, Although in this high-risk group in this study, they refer to adults with comorbidities, you do your ECG. If abnormal, you can order now your biomarkers. If still abnormal, you can do your echocardiography. And they said that patients with dengue shock syndrome, unresponsive to adequate fluid therapy, echocardiography is needed. So how about treatment? Again, there is no antiviral agents that are licensed for dengue. Treatment is supportive, primarily focused on cautious fluid resuscitation. This is the time where you think, where you, if you manage fluid resuscitation, you will now think that this could be a cardiogenic shock. And what is the difference between a hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock? In cardiogenic shock, you give your fluid judiciously. You can give your 5 to 10 cc per kilo, but in a span of 15 to 30 minutes, unlike with your hypovolemic or what we call the uh, IV bolus. Rarely in the tropic support is required, but sometimes if you are considering cardiac, uh, if you are considering heart failure, in the tropic support is warranted. No cardiac specific treatments for dengue myocarditis. How about your card? St standard treatment of cardiac failure can be used successfully in this patient if the patient has, is in congestive heart failure, secondary to your dengue. There is no evidence to support the use of specific antiviral, steroid, or immunoglobulin in dengue myocarditis. Again, they emphasize that early diagnosis of myocardial involvement fluid resuscitation while avoiding overload, and inotropic support with continuous monitoring remain the cornerstone of management in dengue-affected patients with severe myocarditis. How about cardiac manifest comparing COVID and dengue? So this was, this was already uh, mentioned, but I would like to emphasize that um, in the incubation period for Dengue ranges from 3 to 10 days, typically 5 to 7 days. The incubation period for COVID is thought to extend to 14 days with a median of 4 to 5 days from exposure of symptoms. How about the symptoms? The sign and symptoms of you have your febrile phase and your critical phase in dengue. So you have fever. As you can see here, there is no respiratory, there is no respiratory symptoms or if they have they rarely have a respiratory symptoms as compared to your COVID. And one of the important one of the important parameters that you usually think if the patient has fever and you're thinking between a COVID and a, a COVID and a dengue is if there is epidemiologic exposure. So kung meron exposure yung pasyente sa COVID together with the symptoms, then you think you can think that this could be COVID because you cannot really distinguish one from the other. 
So the critical phase here is that may appear in rapid clinical deterioration that they that may appear within 48 hours. And this, however, in COVID, these are must, most persons with the illness have experienced. However, this is not inclusive. How about in severe illnesses? In severe dengue, it's defined by dengue with any of the following symptoms, as was stated before, or plasma leakage, or fluid accumulation. And among patients who develop severe disease of COVID, the median time to dyspnea range from five to eight days. The median time to acute respiratory distress syndrome from eight to 12 days. So medyo late siya na magde-develop pag COVID. And the median time to IC admissions range from 10 to 12 days. Kasi nga, late nga na nag-develop. So that will only be the time na i-admit nila sa ICU. Signs and symptoms for severe illness will include dyspnea, hypoxia, respiratory failure, shock, and multi-organ system dysfunction. So as, as if you compare dengue, unless na nasa dengue shock syndrome na siya, if you compare dengue and COVID, may mga ito mukhang mas toxic ang COVID. Okay. Um, how about your cardiac complications of COVID? Co cardiac complications of COVID will include myocardial injury, will include heart failure and arrhythmia. Okay? And these are your proposed mechanisms. If you can see here, the interstitial myocardial inflammation, direct viral infection, endothelial damage, myocarditis, how about in heart failure and your arrhythmia. So in myocardial injury, it is stated that the term myocardial injury encompasses all conditions causing cardiomyocyte death. And it is commonly clinically identified by the presence of at least one cardiac troponin value above the 99th percentile upper reference to the limit. So there should be marked elevation of biomarkers and then uh, there should be marked elevation of biomarkers regarding cardiovascular system involvement but does not necessarily identify which is, uh, we can identify acute coronary syndrome or heart failure. So mostly this is, uh, occurs in 20-30% hospitalized due to COVID. It is associated with worse and high mortality. And this is secondary to your myocardial inflammation, coronary vasculitis, hypoxic injury, myocarditis, and right ventricular failure. How about arrhythmia in COVID? So this is a study wherein there are 700 hospitalized patients with COVID-19 and these are the events that occurred with those, those patients. Nine developed cardiac arrest, eight and no. So atrial and ventricular wall inflammation is a substrate for the arrhythmia and atrial fibrillation or ventricular arrhythmia have been reported in COVID cardiomyopathies. The mechanism for here is still inflammation ischemia or hypoxia or the compensated heart failure, all of which promotes myocardial injury. How about heart failure? Heart, heart failure is the most common symptomatic cardiac complications in, in COVID. It is associated with increased mortality and it is precipitated by acute illness in patients with pre-existing known or undiagnosed heart disease or meron silang comorbids, or incidents of acute myocardial injury like your stress, cardio, stress cardiomyopathy or acute MI. It's still secondary to your inflammation. It's still secondary to your cytokine hyperactivity or prothrombic state in different organs, causing your endothelial pump dysfunction, causing the decreased barrier, and now causing your heart failure. How about imaging modality? Still, they have the same. However, echocardiography is necessary in patients with COVID, uh, COVID uh, myocarditis or heart, uh, heart, heart complications because you have to check your LV dysfunction, you have to check your RV dysfunction, or you have to check if there is LV or RV enlargement. However, some of them have a normal echocardiogram is still the mechanism is because of your pulmonary thrombotic events, hypox, pulmonary vasoconstriction, cytokine damage, and direct viral damage.
cardiac MRI is also being used, as I had said, because this will evaluate. Uh, it is the only non-invasive modality that allows for tissue characterizations and quantification of the injury to provide prognosis. In COVID, in COVID, my uh, cardiac complications are even in COVID, there are treatment that is being given, especially in severe COVID. These are your IBIG, glucocorticoids, and, and even other therapies like your anakinra and tocilizumab. But these are being in IBIG, IBIG for most patients with moderate to severe if a uh, COVID infection, which is already termed as your MIS-C, even the absence of AD is being given. This includes the following, the shock, the cardiac involvement, LV dysfunction, and the uh, glucose, glucocorticoids is given, uh, the, it is suggested to give glucocorticoids in addition to IVIG in patients with severe or uh, refractory shock. So, in conclusion, dengue can also have specific cardiac manifestations, including functional myocardial impairment, arrhythmias, and myocarditis, which can contribute to the overall severity of the hemodynamic compromise. Functional myocardial impairment and ECG abnormalities can be caused by subclinical myocarditis, myocardial edema, myocardial depressants, coronary hyperfusions, and cal altered calcium hemostasis. Supportive care is still necessary, which includes optimal intravascular volume maintenance with intravenous fluids, the judicious use of diuretics were indicated, and inotropic support when necessary. If in particular, if myocardial involvement is suspected, care should be taken to cause not a uh, to be taken not to cause iatrogenic fluid overload. Much of the evidence suggests that dengue myocarditis is transient and self-limiting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Acosta. And thank you, uh, a very timely and excellent lectures from our pediatric intensivists and pediatric cardiologists. So the floor is now open for your questions. So I have a few questions sent. So any one of our lecturers can um, answer. So can you comment about the importance of interleukin-6 determination routinely in dengue fever? Most studies show that it is higher in dengue, but it is not significantly significant. In comparison to COVID, interleukin-6 is usually one of the markers being requested for management based on severity. So any one of you lecturers can uh, answer the question. Ako ba, John? Tinuro ako agad ni John na. Okay. Um, interleukin-6 is an anti-inflammatory marker. Parang pwede nga si Dr. Ra, ano yata, Jack, sumagot din dyan eh. So it's an inflammatory marker. Pero usually in dengue, we do not really request them. Um, ngayon lang na nagre-request tayo ng interleukin-6 because of COVID-19. So as uh, previous, no, I think two webinars uh, ago, Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday. Um, sinabi nila, one of the, the lecturers, Dr. Sandy Hong, said that um, interleukin-6 is not um, usually used or hindi niya masyadong ginagamit in the C, but rather um, she uses interleukin-1, which is satin, wala din yun, no? Um, interleukin-6 is actually available um, in some institutions, in some private institutions, um, however, this interleukin-6, they are used as an anti-inflammatory markers. Um, I'm not actually sure, kasi sa mga dengue namin, we do not really request for interleukin-6. Parang ngayon lang siya na-request kasi uh, we've known about the COVID, diba, na, um, it's, it increases the interleukin-6. So, yun lang, I'm not actually sure about it in dengue. 
Thank you, Dr. Ang. I think this question, second question is for Dr. John Fernandez. What may be the reason for false positive results of dengue co-infection in COVID patients? As what mentioned in my lecture, um, the cross-reactivity of the antibodies during the time of, of uh, getting the blood sample may be the reason. Mm. Okay, thank you, doctor. For our third question, obesity is noted to be the most common comorbidity for pediatric patients contracting MISC in the U.S. by experience. Uh, in the U.S. by experience, obese pediatric patients having dengue are also one of the high risk population to go into shock. What could be the reason for this? So again, question. Okay, so yes, doc. Yeah, sa akin yata yun. Um, before, before pa naman with the COVID-19, um, obesity, eh, obese patients, medyo mahirap yan talaga i-assess. Um, yung pagbigay pala ng fluids, it's really, really hard, no? So what makes them a risk, for, uh, what makes them to have a risk for for dengue? It's because of inflammatory um, markers. So the adipose tissue really increases the inflammation. So, yung initial mo kasi for any infection, there would be an increase of inflammation. So, tataas talaga siya. So, mas doble siya. Kasi yung adipose tissue mismo, yun yung nag increase So, um, just want to clarify kanina, since an, um, inflammatory pa rin ng dengue, mataas yun. But um, I think one of the um, attendees, no, since sabi nga niya, uh, Dr. De La Cruz, thank you for that. Sinabi nga niya, yes, interleukin 6 is actually high, pero hindi nga natin talaga siya nire-request. Kasi from the WHO protocol, wala yung mga interleukin 6 eh. It just started because of COVID-19. So, ang reason for obesity, mahirap i-approximate yung fluid. The second would be because of the adipose tissue that increases your inflammatory markers. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ang. So for our fourth question, why is zinc the common important micronutri micronutrient in the management of dengue and COVID? Ako ulit. Hey, Dr. Ang. <laughs> Sorry. So zinc, vitamin D, and then um, ano pa ba isa? ascorbic acid. They are immunomodulators. So they, they help in the immune response. Um, kaya nga, but they said, kung balanced diet naman yung pasyente, healthy naman siya before. Tsaka vitamin D, paglaruin mo lang sa labas din yan, may sunlight din, makukuha na rin niya, right? So, um, they are immunomodulators. So, nakita nila that it will help also to boost the immune system of a, of a child. For those, kaya parang sa mga viral infections, di ba? Um, before pa, we, we usually... Um, we usually prescribe zinc, sorry, we usually prescribe zinc and then ascorbic acid. Nowadays lang, um, we start giving the vitamin D. Thank you, Doc. And for our fifth question, for our cardiologist, if there is one cardiac marker which will help us the most in assessing severity of COVID cardiac manifestations at the ER level, what could this be? Ako. Yes, no. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, based on based on the studies, uh, which is being presented, cardiac cardiac uh, the troponin I is the is the best uh marker cardiac uh marker uh cardiac enzyme that you can uh you can request because troponin I, troponin I is a very sensitive marker of myocardial injury. If you have the if you have that in your center. Uh, the other biomarkers that were being uh, stated, if we're talking about dengue, well, the, the usual, the electrolyte imbalance and like that, but they said that uh, most of the articles right now are they saying that it's the trop eye that is very sensitive for biomark for myocardial injury. Okay. Thank you, doctor. And for... Um... We, all, we have one last question 
for doc I think this will be for Dr. Binalay. Uh, do we have any updates for the Dengvaksha vaccine? Any updates? I think this is an ano, unescapable question. <laughs> I think there no there's no um actually there's no um dengue va dengue vaccine updates but for now what is being uh uh thrown into focus is the covid or the covax I think the the vaccine for covid so for now still uh, a controversial issue okay I think it has been and there's no update okay Thank you, lecturers. I think there are no more questions. So um, we would like to proceed in the awarding of certificates. So we award the certification of appreciation to our four resource speakers in grateful recognition for sharing their expertise, given this 30th of October and signed by Dr. Balanag, Dr. Lidwa, and Dr. Raper. And may we invite you to join us every Thursday night for our kids' digital storytelling at our YouTube channel and please support the distance learning of our indigent students. Donate now and make a difference in a child's life. And again, for our next CME, entitled The Life of Skin Care on November 6, 2020, you are all again invited. So for the closing remarks, may I call on Dr. Rosemary Raper our committee head for CME, Dr. Raper. Good evening, Dr. Raper. Or may I call on Dr. Uh, uh, Lidua for the closing remarks, our PPS Northern New Zone Secretary. Good evening. I think Dr. Raper just had an emergency CS. Okay, to everyone who attended our our webinar for tonight to all our attendees, thank you for attending. It was very, a very blockbuster again. We had more full Zoom and more than 100 in our YouTube channel. And to our distinct speakers, Dr. Mel Binalay, Dr. Ramel Ang, Dr. Jan Fernandez, and Dr. Jerry Acosta, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us tonight. Again, we invite you to our future uh, webinars, I hope you all can come and join us again. Thank you very much and have a good night. Naimbag nga rabii, kada kayo nga amin. Okay, thank you Dr. Lidwa and thank you everyone and have a ha happy Halloween. Happy and safe Halloween. And just as a reminder, the committee can only accommodate a maximum of 100 certificates a day, so we ask for your patience. And also reminding again the attendees to answer the survey form. Thank you and good night, everyone. See you on November 6. Thank you.